Hi, thank you very much. So uh, I've been fighting about the destiny of the internet for a long time, since, since 2002, when the big issue on everyone's mind was whether Napster would be liable for the things its users did or whether those users would be individually liable. And back then, I struggled to convey to skeptics that the outcome of the Napster fight was about more than access to music. It was about the network would, uh, that would someday grow to be the nervous system of our planet and our species would be regulated as though it were a kind of troublesome jukebox. Uh, then, as the years went by, something changed. People woke up to the fact that the internet was not a glorified video-on-demand service or a pornography distribution system or the world's greatest tool for recruiting jihadis. The internet was a tool that had become essential to every part of our life, family and romance, education and employment, political and civic engagement, play and business. And while that didn't mean that we couldn't hope to regulate it, it did mean that we had to regulate it wisely with the gravitas and the sense that a misstep could have unintended consequences that could ripple out very far into many domains of our lives. And as this uh, mood began to build, and a movement that took the internet seriously in policy circles spread, I began to hold out hope for a reversal of some of our earlier and more stupid mistakes. Rules that were originally, for example, there were rules that were uh, uh, originally intended to add legal weight to nuisances like the way that DVDs enforce region coding. So this is a strange thing. Those of you who are too young to remember DVDs, this, the, there are modern equivalents, but DVD is a, is a good example here. When DVDs are sold, they're sold in a way that only allows you to watch the disc on a player that was sold in the same country as the disc. And this is weird, right? Because going to India and buying a disc and then bringing it home and watching it, assuming it's like a licensed disc, that's not a copyright infringement, right? It's the actual like opposite of a copyright infringement. You go to a retailer who has a licensed product, you pay the asking price, and then you enjoy the product. If that's copyright infringement, we infringe copyright all day long. But of course, the studios, they had a kind of business model preference that it would be possible to sell a disc for one price in one territory and for another price in another territory, and to stop people from bringing the disc from one territory to the other to watch it. And, um, there was no way to enforce that using plain copyright law. So these scams, they needed a kind of legal backing that allowed firms to enforce their commercial preferences as though they were the same thing as legal rules. And we got uh, this, this rule called the anti-circumvention rule. And what the anti-circumvention rule says is if you have a lock that stops you from accessing a copyrighted work that you can't tamper with the lock, even, even if you own the copyrighted work, right? even if it's your own stuff, behind the lock, you can't tamper with the lock. You have to use the lock in accord with the manufacturer's wishes. And as I said, originally, this was a petty scam. It affected DVD players, Sega Dreamcasts, you know, things that were around the margin of our lives. But as time went on, a lock that restricts access to a copyrighted work became a thing that you could have in anything that had software in it, because software is a copyrighted work, which went, meant that manufacturers could use this law to enforce their commercial preferences over your use of virtually any kind of good. So then we started to see these software logs showing up to force you to conduct yourself to the manufacturer's benefit in products as diverse as implanted defibrillators and car engines and thermostats and coffee makers, tractors, voting machines, the seismic damper that keeps this building from falling down in a high wind. And these laws, they originated in the U.S. in the late 90s, but the rest of the world caught up thanks to the uh, tender administrations, the U.S. Trade Representative, who made it clear that ongoing good relationships with America would require it. Canada adopted this rule in 2011, which is embarrassing that in 2011 we were making these stupid mistakes. And these laws, they became an attractive nuisance because they promised manufacturers that they only needed to configure their technology so that using them in a dispreferred way would require bypassing a copyrighted lock. And then they could invent a law that no parliament had ever passed, but every court would enforce that you could call felony contempt of business model, right? Where failure to arrange your affairs to benefit the shareholders of the manufacturer became a literal, a literal jailable crime punishable in the U.S. by a $500,000 fine and a five-year prison sentence for a first offense. And this had knock-on effects because if you're a security researcher who audits any of these products and you discover a defect, that might help someone bypass a copyright lock, 
then you can't come forward with that disclosure lest you risk this kind of prosecution, which meant that every kind of device became slowly but surely a reservoir for long-lived digital pathogens that good guys knew about and couldn't tell us about, and bad guys knew about and could exploit at will. So as the years went by and more people got online and network policy touched more corners of our lives, the absurdity of using copyright law, which was invented to regulate the entertainment industry, as the tool for uh, a first defense for regulating the entire internet, it became more obvious to more people that this was a foolish move and that it seemed time was ready for a change. But then the last year happened. The last 12 months have been a nightmarish assault on every gain that we have made on making the internet safe for human habita habitation, with reversal after reversal and worse on our horizon. From the Australian ban on working security technology to America's attack on the online discussion of sex and sexuality to the European mandate for copyright filters for all video, audio, text, and other communications. And now in the wake of Christchurch, Australia, the EU, the UK, and other territories are, uh, are mandating a system of easy takedowns of material on the basis that it may uh, help a terrorist somewhere with no checks and no balances. We are living through the real-time, high-speed, nightmarish chinification of the Western Internet, where our networks are being subject to surveillance and control that has not been dreamt of since the days when countries had a single phone company that could control everything their customers did. But unlike those old days of a state-owned Bell Canada, the telephones don't hang on our kitchen walls. We carry them in our pockets, and they know everywhere we go and everything we do, and they are privy to every significant interaction we have. Um, and uh, unlike in those days when the phones hung on our kitchen wall, if you want to spy on all the phones, you don't need to hire giant boiler rooms full of snoops to listen in on them. You can just use algorithms to do the dirty work for them. So I want to take a minute to delve into those new systems of surveillance and control that have popped up in the last year, because it has been a busy year, and you could be forgiven for having missed this news as the world came at you fast. So let's start with a ban on working cryptography. Since the late 1980s, lawmakers, criminal uh, spies, and um, uh, uh, law enforcement officers have been warning that everyday people should not get access to working cryptography. Until 1992, the U.S. National Security Administration classed working cryptography as a munitions and refused to allow civilian access to it. But in 1992, uh, the, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, for whom I'm proud to, to work as a special consultant, brought a lawsuit on behalf of uh, then a grad student, now an eminent cryptographer, named Daniel J. Bernstein. Uh, and, and DJB was a grad student at the University of California at Berkeley, and he was publishing the source code, the underlying program code, for ciphers stronger than the ones the NSA said that civilians should have, should have access to. And the Electronic Frontier Foundation represented Bernstein in the Ninth Circuit, claiming that his First Amendment right to free speech included the right to publish source code. And not only did the Ninth Circuit uh, affirm this, but the appellate division did as well. And the NSA decided not to take their chances with the Supreme Court. And uh, since then, we've had access to security technology. And uh, every one of us now uses strong crypto of the sort that the NSA wanted to prohibit us from using, that the NSA said would usher in the four horsemen of the infocalypse, uh, pornographers, terrorists, criminals, and um, sex traffickers. Uh, or no, sorry, drug dealers. Those are the four horsemen. Uh, th every one of us uses this crypto all day long. You take a picture with your phone and it encrypts it automatically in an eye blink to such a degree of certainty that if every hydrogen atom in the universe were converted to a computer, and it did nothing until the end of the universe but try and guess the key needed to unscramble that photo, we run out of universe long before we run out of possible keys. Our networks automatically encrypt everything we send. Our Bluetooth devices use encryption to stop us from being snooped on or having our devices hijacked. When your computer or your pacemaker or your printer or your car receives an operating system update over the air or by a USB key, it uses encryption to prevent tampering, to validate that the system was signed by the manufacturer and that you can trust it to stop you from receiving malicious updates that could compromise your privacy, your security, or even your physical well-being all the way up to your life. Uh, 
Crypto protects the integrity of your data, of your communications, and of your devices. It's what stands between you and identity theft, or someone murdering you by compromising your car's operating system, or just the operating system of your medical implant. And modern cryptography works. And that's great news when it comes to protecting you. But authoritarians have never given up on this project of banning crypto and banishing the Four Horsemen of the Infocalypse. And they insist that this is possible and desirable despite all reason and expert input. So the former Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull had proposed this, and the experts told him that the laws of mathematics said that we could not make crypto that worked perfectly when we needed, to we needed it to protect us against criminals and terrorists, but failed totally when the police needed it to spy on criminals and terrorists. And Malcolm Turnbull said the stupidest thing that anyone has ever said about internet policy, which is, it's a really um, competitive field, but he said this, the laws of Australia prevail in Australia. I can assure you of that. The laws of mathematics may be very commendable, but the only law that applies in Australia is the law of Australia. Now, that's funny, but the next year, last year, the Australian government passed a law requiring that any tech company that operates in Australia has to, on demand, introduce defects into their encryption that would allow law enforcement to penetrate it on the assumption that no criminal would ever figure out whatever trick law enforcement was using to compromise those devices and attack people in Australia. All right, so that's crypto. Now let's talk about everyone's favorite subject, sex. The world's democracies uh, integrated the internet into their legal systems with a, a new regime they called safe harbors. Uh, the idea of safe harbor is that if you are an online platform and you provide a place where people can communicate, you don't have a duty to spy on everything that those users post and vet it to see whether it offends some law, whether they're committing a crime, whether they are uh, uh, being obscene, whether they are infringing copyright. But uh, the quid pro quo for people who might be victimized by those criminal acts is that if you're that online speech hoster, you have to be prepared to remove speech if um, someone comes along and claims that it infringes their rights without a court order, without evidence. You know, I used to work just down the road at, at Baca, the science fiction bookstore back when I was at Queen and Peter. And if you walked into the store and pointed at a book on the shelf and said, that book infringes my copyright, I wouldn't take the book down. But if you are an $11 an hour minimum wage employee overseas in a boiler room working for one of the big platforms and you get an email that says that ebook infringes my copyright, it comes down in an eye blink. Right? So that is the quid pro quo of safe harbors. We get to express ourselves, but our speech has this fragile uh, nature to it. And it's been an imperfect balance, but we're replacing it with something much worse. We are eroding safe harbors, and the first line of ass assault is... Um, sex. So in the US, the safe harbor rules set under the Communications Decency Act, they had a pretty significant exception. They did not uh, excuse uh, tech companies from liability if they, if, they're, if they knew that someone was engaged in sex trafficking and human trafficking using their platforms. They were criminally liable if that happened. Uh, once they knew that it was happening, they were on notice, they had to do something about it. But that was not enough. Uh, back in 2018, a year ago, Congress passed uh, a set of bills that were supposed to protect people from sex trafficking called SESTA and FOSTA. And under this new law, platforms are liable if someone is using their platform to engage in sex trafficking, even if they don't know about it. They acquire an obligation to know about what all of the things their users are doing in order to interdict sex trafficking, which is unquestionably a horrible crime. And this duty is so onerous that after FOSTA-SESTA was adopted, almost every US-based online service shuttered all of the places in which people consensually arranged to have sex with each other. They could not take the chance that a single one of those interactions would be non-consensual because that would give rise to criminal liability. And at the time, sex workers and people who advocated for them said that this would chase them offline and back onto the streets where they would face danger, and a year later, that is indeed the case. People who advocate for sex workers and sex workers themselves say that sex workers are facing much greater violence than they ever have before because they're no longer able to use online services even to discuss which johns they shouldn't service because they are violent or dangerous. And uh, as a result of this, pimping is making a comeback for the first time since the internet came along and started to erode the need for pimps as a form of protection because now sex workers who are on the street are having to, uh, to seek out this service. 
And sex has become this go-to excuse for attacking privacy, anonymity, and speech in all its forms. Starting mid-July, people in the UK who want to access pornography will have to register with an age verification service before accessing any adult content. And any UK-based adult service that doesn't make use of these age verification services will, be, uh, will face criminal and civil liability. Any foreign service that does this out of the UK service will be blocked at the National Firewall, which was built in the name of stopping terrorism and has now been expanded to stop people from looking at naked people. Um, uh, and these, these uh, age checks, they're going to be based on credit cards. Uh, and that means that when these databases leak, not if these databases leak, when these databases leak, attackers will have access to a list of the kinks and sexual fantasies of every British porn consumer linked to their financial data for easy cross-referencing for blackmail purposes. And then there's Tumblr. Oh, Tumblr. <laughs> Tumblr was once a haven for sexual expression, including, notably, women's sexual expression, and the sexual expression of people who don't have heteronormative sexual identities, LGBTQ people. And in 2018, Apple got worried about its liability under FOSTA and SESTA because people were talking about having sex with each other on Tumblr. And they kicked the Tumblr app out of the App Store. Uh, and since Apple makes use of these anti-circumvention rules, if you're not in the App Store, and uh, no one can get your app even if they want it because the anti-circumvention rules would require jailbreaking your phone in order to access a different app store. And that meant that Tumblr uh, was about to lose a large slice of its audience. So uh, Tumblr instituted a ban on all adult content. And again, there isn't a boiler room big enough to have someone look at all the Tumblr posts and decide which ones were nudity and which ones aren't, let alone make the decision about whether it was good nudity or bad nudity. So they decided that they would use machine learning filters to catch all the nudity. You probably can guess how this turns out even if you haven't been paying attention because filters are crude instruments. These are all posts from my Tumblr that have been blocked uh, on Tumblr. I want to call your attention specifically to the one there on your uh, far, uh, I guess it's your left. Um, that's the post that replicates the image that Tumblr published to tell you what kind of nudity wouldn't be blocked. That was blocked by Tumblr. So, speaking of filters, last month, the European Union took the most drastic step to censor and centralize the internet in the history of the so-called free world. The European Parliament passed a new copyright directive, including something that had garnered a lot of controversy, the dread Article 13. Well, Article 13 is a rule that obliterates safe harbor for copyright altogether. It makes platforms liable if their users infringe copyright, even if the platforms don't know that the infringement is taking place. It's sesta fosta for copyright infringement. And it creates a duty to monitor everything your users post, but not in forums for sexuality in all forums. Images, music, videos, everything down to a Minecraft skin. And of course that means filters. There's no way to do this without filters. YouTube alone gets 400 hours of video every minute. There's no way you're going to be able to monitor all of that for copyright infringement without filters. But that didn't stop the proponents of this from saying, well, the filters are going to be optional. They're not mentioned in the directive. In fact, if you read the directive, it says, if at all possible, don't use filters. Right? But of course, the fact that it says don't use filters, but sets up a task that could only be accomplished with filters, tells you whether or not filters are going to be in place. If I say to you, I require that as a matter of law, you produce a large, four-legged, gray, charismatic African land mammal with tusks and a trunk and a tail. But if at all possible, don't give me an elephant, we're still going to have an elephant in the room. And indeed, in the few weeks since this was passed, and, and I have to say, this was passed by five votes, and later on, 10 members of the European Parliament said that they pressed the wrong button by accident, had their votes amended, but because of the European parliamentary rules, the official record reflects that we won the vote, but the actual uh, legislative course is determined by the vote in the moment, and we lost the vote. UX kills. Um, and in the weeks since that terrible moment, the European uh, Commission and the governments of France and Germany, all of whom insisted that filters would not be required, have said filters will absolutely be required. And that means that everything you post will be compared to a database of copyrighted work to decide whether or not it's too similar to go live. But it's not actually a database of copyrighted work. It's a database of things that someone somewhere on the internet said was a copyrighted work. 
And notably, during the negotiations over Article 13, every party to the negotiation who was a proponent of Article 13 said that they, uh, they would not countenance any punishment for people who accidentally or deliberately claim copyright in works that they didn't own in order to stop them from being posted online. So anyone can claim copyright over anything. The works of Shakespeare, the alphabet, happy birthday, or of course, a video of a cop hitting a protester, or a picture of some company's effluent pipe pumping pollution into the water supply. And once that is claimed, it can't be posted. But wait, there's more. Because just after this directive passed, there was a horrific terrorist attack committed by a white nationalist in New Zealand who shot up two mosques in Christchurch and murdered 50 people. And in the wake of that attack, countries around the world have scrambled to erode safe harbor even more, adopting rules that require platforms to remove anything that might be construed as terrorist or violent within one hour. Australia has adopted this rule already. The EU has advanced it to a critical stage, although they've removed the requirement for filters. Filters will nevertheless, of course, be a part of it. The UK has just advanced a proposal in the mother of all parliaments there. And in case you're thinking that that sounds reasonable because anything is better than what happened when this terrorist live streamed his murder spree, consider that the day before this went to a vote in the European Parliament, the French anti-terror police sent a terror takedown notice to the Internet Archive under existing French law, and they claimed that um, there was terrorist content somewhere in 15 million text files, the entirety of Project Gutenberg, and their archive of Grateful Dead recordings, and gave them 24 hours to figure out what it was or take all of that material down. Under the pending regulation, it wouldn't be 24 hours that they had, it would be one hour. And if they failed to comply, they would face criminal liability. Um, almost overnight, we have gone from an internet where speech had the presumption of innocence, where you could post almost anything and it would stay live until at least someone accused it of some wrongdoing, to an internet where increasingly all speech of all kind is being judged by a set of unaccountable black box AI algorithms and automatically censored if it seems to fall into nebulous categories like extremism or nudity or copyright infringement. And this happened all on our watch. No one is happy living on a surveillance-riddled internet where almost everything uh, uh, happens on five giant websites that mostly consist of screenshots from the other four. And so we were all only too happy to see the giant platforms being punished. But ironically, in punishing them, we've given them more power. Think of how filters will affect the balance of power on the internet. Google has a filter that complies with Article 13. They spent $100 million developing a filter for YouTube called Content ID. And during the European copyright debate, the CEO of YouTube uh, wrote a blog post that said filters are actually a pretty good answer. They would like Article 13 modified in some ways, but filters were a reasonable way to solve this problem because while Google would prefer to have no regulation, the second best version of no regulation is a regulation that Google can comply with, but no competitor of Google's can comply with. There aren't any European startups with $100 million to build their own content ID. So at the stroke of a pen, the European Union snuffed out its entire tech sector, signed its death warrant, leaving the field open for about five giant US-based tech platforms to dominate all of the internet in Europe. And that UK porn blockade, it's going to be administered by a Canadian company, maybe some of you work for it, called MindGeek. MindGeek owns Pornhub, RedTube, YouPorn, Browsers, Digital Playground, Men.com, Reality Kings, and Sean Cody. And it's a company that grew through the underhanded tactic of taking stuff from sites that weren't part of its empire, putting it on its free sites, dragging its heels when it came to removing copyright infringement, and when those companies ended up uh, at the brink of bankruptcy, it snapped them up at fire sale prices. And now the only companies it hasn't managed to devour are going to be responsible to it and are going to have to depend on it for their users. Is it any wonder that Mark Zuckerberg, three weeks ago, went to Congress and said, go ahead and give us some rules to regulate Facebook? With Facebook at the table when those rules are crafted, those regulations will be one that Facebook can enforce and no one else can live, to, live up to. So how do we get here? How is it that the tech sector is so damned concentrated? Well, 
people in the tech sector who are apologists for this kind of concentration, they'll say that it's something intrinsic to tech. It's network effects. It's first mover advantages. But I know with some interest that we're not all searching Alta Vista with our craze or silicon graphics. So there's clearly something more to it. And uh, I think you can tell that there's more to it by looking at what's happened in every other sector and not just tech. There are four movie studios left. It was five until last month when Disney bought Fox. There are four record labels left. There's still five publishers, but the rumor is that Simon & Schuster is going to end up a division of HarperCollins pretty soon. And um, uh, a lot of you probably wear glasses, like me. Uh, if you are wearing glasses sold as Armani, Brooks Brothers, Burberry, Chanel, Coach, DKNY, Dolce & Gabbana, Michael Kors, Oakley, Oliver Peoples, Purcell, Polo Ralph Lauren, Ray-Ban, Tiffany, Valentino, Vogue or Versace, or if you bought your glasses at Pearl Vision, Sears Optical, Sunglass Hut, Target Optical, or Lens Crafters, or if they were insured by iMed Vision Care, or if your lenses were made by Essilor, the largest manufacturer of lenses and contact lenses in the world, they came from one company called Luxottica in Italy. But it's not just eyewear, it's wrestling. <laughs> there were 30 wrestling companies 40 years ago. Now there's one. It's worth $3.5 billion. Its owners are major Trump donors. And it gets to class its wrestlers, who have nowhere else to work for as contractors, and not insure them. And they're dropping like flies. They're dying on the job, because there's nowhere else to turn. So, how did everything get so concentrated? For that, we have to go back in time to a very special year, 1979, the year the Apple II Plus debuted. Uh, the first commercially successful personal computer hit the market in the same year that this guy hit the, command tra the campaign trail. Uh, Ronald Reagan was part of a wave of global deregulators. Brian Mulroney in Canada, Margaret Thatcher in the UK, um, uh, Augusto Pinochet in Chile, infamously, Helmut Kohl in Germany. And they took power at a moment in which the uh, relatively even income distribution we had after World War II, when most of the money in the world was spent on bombs and the, what was left was spread out among the people who, who survived it, at a moment in which that wealth had become concentrated again into a few hands, a small enough number of hands that they could once again start to dictate our policy outcomes, including the bizarre theory of antitrust law that Reagan and his peers subscribed to. Under this theory of antitrust law, the consumer harm theory, antitrust does not exist to stop monopolies. It only exists to prevent consumer harm in the form of higher prices. And Reagan and his successors dismantled antitrust all around the world. In living memory, it was illegal for companies to grow by merging with their largest competitors or buying up their nascent competitors. You could own a rail, rail line or you could ship freight, but you couldn't own both. Companies weren't allowed to merge with their rivals. They weren't allowed to buy emerging competitors. And today, we're asked to believe that something has changed in our technology that makes monopolies inevitable. But every monopolist that we know about became a monopolist by merging with their largest rivals and buying their nascent competitors. Google's a great example. Apart from search and Gmail, every notable success of that company has been the result of acquiring a company that it would never have been allowed to buy under pre-Reagan, pre-Mulroney antitrust rules. And then there's Facebook. Facebook tells advertisers that it spies on us so much that it can tell exactly what we're going to do, and that it can use its machine learning systems to convince us of anything that an advertiser of any kind wants us to believe. Facebook claims that they've used machine learning to create a mind control ray. But what I think Facebook really has is detailed non-consensual profiles on 2.3 billion people that it can use to target them. If you're trying to locate someone with a really hard to find trait, like someone thinking of buying a refrigerator, something that most of us do less than two times in our lives, Facebook can offer uh, the advertiser of, refri of refrigerators ads targeted to recent home buyers, or people who have priced out kitchen remodels, or people who have searched for fri fridge reviews, and they can cross-reference them by geography and net worth. Now, that is creepy and gross, but it's not mind control. It's just a high surveillance version of selling ice water on a hot day. Or, you know, when I was born at Women's College Hospital down the road, the next day a guy showed up in the maternity ward with coupons for diapers. Right? That's not mind control. It's just creepy. Now, it benefits Facebook to claim that it has a mind control ray. Companies like Cambridge Analytica made millions off the idea that it had a mind control ray. They told us that if they were allowed to use machine learning, they could turn reasonable people into Trump voters and Brexit supporters. 
But isn't it more likely that they just found racists and convinced them that Trump and Brexit were the kind of thing they should get out there and support? We know that every claim Facebook makes is a self-serving lie. Don't take my word for it. The Minister of State for New Zealand just said everything Facebook says is a self-serving lie. So why do we believe it's sales literature? Users like, don't like Facebook, but they can't escape it. 15 million 13 to 35-year-old Americans left Facebook in 2018, but they mostly went to a company called Instagram, which is, of course, a Facebook subsidiary that Facebook never would have been allowed to buy before Mulroney, Reagan, and co. started to dismantle antitrust. In fact, if you want a little fairy tale about how antitrust and privacy and surveillance and corruption go together, the Instagram story is about the best one you could turn to. Few of us remember that from Facebook's rollout to about 10 years after, Facebook billed itself as the pro-privacy alternative to systems like Orkut and MySpace. They said that the reason that they needed to put you inside a walled garden was to stop companies like Google from getting their grubby hands on your data. They promised that they would never spy on you or mine your data. But every time one of its competitors went under, Facebook broke a promise, apologized for it, and restored things to a state that was slightly more surveilling than they were before. Lather, rinse, repeat, and now Facebook is the global uh, surveillance giant that it is, and no one invests in social media anymore because no one can hope to uh, uh, compete with Facebook, except for one company. There is, in fact, one company that just does social media and is a viable, uh, widely used Facebook competitor, and the, their main offering is, we're like Facebook, only we're more private, and they're called Snapchat. And Snapchat's whole pitch was, leave Facebook, come to us, and we won't save your data forever and mine it. And people left Facebook by the millions to join Snapchat. So what did Facebook do? Well, Facebook had acquired another company, a company they never would have been allowed to buy, called Onavo. Onavo made an app that was notionally a battery monitor. It was actually a surveillance tool that gathered telemetry on its users. Facebook used Onavo to find out that people were leaving Facebook to join Snapchat. And on the basis of that market intelligence, they bought Instagram. And then they refined Instagram's feature set by spying on Snapchat users using the Onavo app. Every single part of that story would have been illegal before we dismantled antitrust. Acquiring Onovo, spying on users with it, buying Instagram. But today, despite a market hungry for privacy, we have no privacy social network. Privacy owns, or Facebook owns all of the users who might join that network, and it's not going to let them out. You know, when Facebook started, the majority of potential Facebook users were on MySpace. And that was a big problem for Facebook. People didn't want to leave their friends behind. So Facebook made a robot that would log into MySpace as you. You gave it your login credentials. It would pretend to be you. It would grab the messages waiting for you, put them in your, MySpace, in your Facebook inbox. You could reply to them. It would send them back to MySpace. And there would be a footer that said, sent from Facebook, stop using MySpace. But then, uh, a few years later, a rival tried to do this to Facebook. A company called Power Ventures made a tool that took your waiting Facebook messages and put them in a new inbox. And Facebook paid a lot of money for some very fancy lawyers and some law review articles that argued that a Ronald Reagan era law called the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act passed in a panic after Reagan saw, and I'm not making this up, Matthew Broderick in War Games somehow prohibited this activity. They crushed uh, uh, Power Ventures, and no one has tried it since. So to recap, we're on Facebook because everyone we want to talk to is there. Facebook dom Facebook's dominance allows them to coerce every web publisher in the world into putting Facebook like buttons, which are just surveillance beacons, on every web page in the world, which allows them to uh, dominate the ad market. Facebook's only viable competitor was a pro-privacy alternative, which Facebook is crushing with antitrust tactics that, though radioactively illegal, haven't been enforced against in a generation. And even though people are leaving Facebook in droves, they're, running, uh, they're ending up on other platforms that Facebook owns that it shouldn't have been allowed to buy. And all this is not because tech is different. I don't know about you, but if you dismantle monopoly protection and then you get monopoly tactics, I think it's a reasonable conclusion to say maybe it was the mon anti-monopoly tactics that stopped us from having monopolies. For one thing, if we didn't have one big Facebook, the decisions that Facebook engineers make wouldn't be nearly so consequential because they wouldn't reach 2.3 billion people. But of course, some people say that Facebook isn't just the place where you go if you want your terrorist atrocity uh, videos to be streamed. They say that it's where you go if you want to recruit people to commit terrorist atrocities. 
And there is some truth to that. Between the engagement algorithms that uh, guide people down a path towards more and more extreme and controversial material so that you, they generate more ad revenues through more clicks, um, and, and also the ability to target users based on their rece receptiveness to these messages, um, the platforms have made it ever easier than ever to recruit people to the cause of genocide. But if Facebook is a people-finding system and not a mind control ray, it's worth asking why there are so many people who are receptive to messages about the desirability of genocide or conspiracies like anti-vax and the flat earth. And I think that this too starts with Ronald Reagan. 40 years ago, neoliberal policies started making the richest among us much richer in a world where everyone got much poorer with the result that our institutions, our institutions no longer operate on the basis of evidence, but rather they operate to enrich the highest bidder, whether that's obfuscating the link between tobacco and cancer, or emissions and climate change, or opioids and addiction, or the copyright directive and filters. It is not paranoid or conspiratorial to say that the people who are in our pay and whose job it is to adjudicate among all the evidence and make policies that are good for all of us are uh, terminally compromised by inequality. So you get a kind of breakdown, what I, what I sometimes call the epistemological crisis, where it's not just the case that we no longer agree on what's true, it's the case that we no longer agree on how we know something is true. Think of anti-vax. It's not foolish to say that pharma companies have gotten big and concentrated, operate with impunity, and kill the people that they're supposed to be making better. Just look at Purdue Pharma, who started the opioid epidemic. Right? Ten years ago, they got a small study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, 12 case studies of people who'd been given OxyContin, and they argued on that basis that opioids were not addictive and that people were being undertreated and left to suffer in pain. Uh, they, they got the FDA, who was filled with people who hoped to someday get a job working for a company like Purdue Pharma to let them make these claims. And now, ten years later, more Americans have died from opioid addiction than were killed in Vietnam. So if 10 years ago you had said, I think that the pharmaceutical companies are conspiring against us and the regulators are letting them get away with it, if you were talking about opioids, you wouldn't have been wrong. Now, you'd have been wrong if you were talking about vaccines, but it's easy to see how in that world people see conspiracies because we are living in a world with a lot of conspiracies. Uh, you know, think of the SNC-Lavalin crisis that's ripping through Parliament right now or Exxon covering up its own knowledge of its contribution to climate change and where the Earth was headed, or the NSA wiretapping the whole world's internet with the cooperation of the big tech companies. And these conspiracies don't come cheap. The authorities who help them along expect handsome rewards. They're the sort of thing that you can only pull off in a new gilded age where policies have already been put in place that make rich people rich enough that they have extra capital lying around to influence lawmakers. We won't make conspiracies implausible until we get rid of conspiracies, and we can't do that until we tackle wealth inequality. If we punish the platforms for their monopolistic abuses by imposing new duties on them that only the very largest companies can afford, duties to monitor and filter their users, we just cement their dominance. We put a floor on how small we can ever make them. We once dreamed of an internet that was democratic, where we all got a say in its future. But if we invest the, the platforms with state-like duties, we are uh, turning our, our internet into a constitutional monarchy where they get to rule forever with the divine right of kings and they are bound at the periphery by a parliament of aristocrats who are lawmakers and regulators who ask them nicely to take on some state-like duties. That's why it's dangerous to say things like, if you're not paying for the product, you're the product. You can spend $1,000 on an iPhone and Apple will still sell you They'll sell you to service centers by thwarting right to repair bills and making sure they're the only ones who get to fix your phone. They'll sell you to app vendors by making sure that they're the only store. And it's not just Apple. John Deere will charge you half a million dollars for a tractor and do the same thing to you. Under conditions of monopoly, even if you're paying for the product, you are still the product. Because the problem isn't that some companies are good and other companies are bad. It's when companies no longer fear democratic controls, they abuse us in every way that they can get away with. Google makes money by spying on you. Apple makes money by locking you in. Facebook makes money by locking you in and by spying on you. Adding price tags to free services will, only, will not make them more democratic or accountable. Conditioning access to culture in conditions of inequality just means that rich people get to buy more speech than they already do. The only way to make big tech accountable is to make it small tech. 
break up the monopolies, ban the practice of mergers and acquisitions, crack down on vertical integration. It has been a hell of a year for the internet and for the planet and for our species. And we have major challenges ahead of us, challenges that put the regulation of the internet in the shade. Climate change, gender-based violence and discrimination, racial-based violence and discrimination, white nationalism and other ultranationalist movements around the world and the growth of authoritarianism. And I don't think we should fight for the internet because it's, it's more important than those things. The internet isn't what we should be fighting for, but the internet is surely what we are going to fight with. It's the terrain on which every other one of those fights will be won or lost. If we lose the internet, we lose those battles before we join them. We once dreamt of a democratic tech. Once we thought that STEM education was a way to teach technological self-defense so our kids would not be programmed, but program. It wasn't just job preparation to work for a big digital monopolist. A democratic, anti-oligopic anti technological future is still possible, but only if we seize the means of computation and use it to organize, to demand a future where we are neither, neither spied upon nor locked in, a future where technology sets us free and does not put us in chains. Thank you. Thanks.